comprehensive, relevant, and insightful conversations about health and medicine happen here on MedStar Health Doc Talk. Diagnosing and treating cancers of the brain and central nervous system, as well as the neurological side effects that result from treatment, is a growing and evolving medical field known as neuro-oncology. Many brain cancers are secondary, meaning that the cancer started growing somewhere else, increasing the need for a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. To unravel the complexity of brain and spinal cord tumors, and to learn more about neuro-oncology, we have the trifecta of experts. Welcome medical oncologist Dr. Massimo Hebtash, radiation oncologist Dr. Kelly Orwat, and neurosurgeon Dr. Teresa Vodashevitz. I'm your host, Deborah Schindler. Thank you for being here, doctors. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. Just hearing the words brain tumor can be very daunting. And though rare compared to other forms of malignancies, the World Health Organization has identified more than 100 different types of primary and secondary brain tumors. Is that understanding new in the field and maybe contributing to the growth of the specialty? Yeah. So what's really important is just to highlight how varied, uh, you know, brain tumors can be. And when a patient gets a diagnosis or hears brain tumor, that can mean so many different things, ranging from a benign kind of process, even a cyst they may have been born with that just looks like it could be a tumor, to, you know, ranging from those kinds of benign lesions all the way to horrible malignant tumors that ultimately have a very poor prognosis. So it, there's such varied tumors and even within each individual subtype of tumors, we're finding that each individual subtype is not just its own tumor, that they have their own individual, even tinier subdivisions within those groups. So we're finding even within that, you know, couple hundred of the, you know, bulk diagnoses, every person's tumor is more and more individual. So I think the trend overall, not just in neuro-oncology, but oncology in general, really is that idea of personalized medicine. And just as all of the other fields in oncology have been really adapting to that, I think neuro-oncology really has, has done a lot with that, too. Uh, I think Dr. Mohabtash, I'm sure, could comment a lot on how uh, immunotherapy has evolved in these recent years. I'm seeing more and more patients on immunotherapy for their, um, you know, their secondary tumors. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, the field of immunotherapy is growing very fast. Um Response to different immunotherapies on different tumors are different. Like some tumors are very immunoresponsive, like lung cancer, um, some breast cancers, kidney cancer, or melanomas. Some tumors are not as responsive. So as uh, you mentioned, uh, some tumors in the brain, which has started in a different place and spread to the brain, if they are immunogenic and responsive to immunotherapy, that's a very good option for them. For the primary brain tumors starting in the brain, the study is still ongoing. There is a modest effect to immunotherapy, but we are trying to combine immunotherapy with different treatments like targeted therapy or chemotherapies and make it more effective. We are trying different vaccines, which the different modality for immunotherapy to see if it works in certain types of cancers, so including brain cancer. But it's a very active field. There are lots of studies and clinical trials going on, recruiting patients with brain tumors to immunotherapy or combination immunotherapy. How can you tell it's a primary tumor versus a secondary tumor? So sometimes by the way it looks on a CAT scan or MRI, we are able to see or say, or if the patient already has history of lung cancer, uh, like stage 3B lung cancer, and then all of a sudden, you know, something pops up in the head, we have a high likelihood of knowing that this is most likely brain, but many times we have to biopsy to know for sure. Yeah. I've definitely had, you know, a handful of patients where it wasn't super clear whether, you know, they're, you know, they had cancer somewhere else that came back and is spread to the brain or whether it's coming from the brain individually. What's really important and, you know, the most common cancers that come up in the brain are cancers that spread from somewhere else in the body or those secondary cancers that we're talking about. Uh, the brain has what's called a blood brain barrier. So a lot of chemotherapy doesn't reach the brain the same way it reaches the rest of the body. So sometimes folks can have cancer that's totally under control everywhere else, but the brain, because it's so protected from the rest of the body, just doesn't respond, which is where, you know, the immuno therapy can really help us out. And there are some patients where it's not, you know, you look at the rest of the body and it's that you don't see anything anywhere else. And all you can see is the lesion in the brain. And the only way to know for sure what it is, is to take it out and look at it under a microscope. 
I want to get to the biopsy part. I want to know how that happens. But I want to know first, how does a cancer from somewhere else in the body get to the brain? And what type of cancers are most commonly found in your experience? So cancers that spread from somewhere else in the body to the brain get there through the blood system. They gain access to first capillaries and arteries and ultimately make their way up to the brain. So they somehow get through that blood-brain barrier. As far as the most common types we see, we know certain types of lung cancer really do have a very strong affinity for the brain. For example, a small cell lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Even non-small cell lung cancers are slightly more common in the brain. So if you are diagnosed, we always do get an MRI to make sure that you don't have any involvement in the brain that just hasn't shown symptoms yet. Others that are relatively prone to spread to the brain would be things like melanoma, renal cell, breast cancer, far less common that we see things like prostate cancer spread to the brain. Getting back to the biopsy, tell me how that happens. Yeah, so there's no such thing as a truly minimally invasive or laser approach for, you know, getting a, a specimen of brain tissue. You have to go through bone. You know, you always have to go through the skull. So it is always an open op it's always an open operation. There's always going to be an incision. But what I find is really quite remarkable is how quickly patients recover from a brain operation. And there's a wide variety of different kinds of approaches that we can take depending on what our goal is. If someone has widely spread disease throughout their brain and we're just trying to get a tissue specimen where we know we're not going to be able to get all of that tumor, then that can be done with a needle biopsy and an incision that's about half an inch, three quarters of an inch long. And, you know, they'll go, they typically go home that next day and then get an answer within, you know, about two weeks or so. But there are other kinds of lesions where we know we're able, we're going to be able to get the entire lesion. And sometimes for some kinds of, of tumors, once you get the lesion out of the brain, that's it. If it's a primary tumor that's a low-grade or not a malignant tumor that's not a cancer, that's a benign tumor, the surgery itself removes that tumor, relieves that pressure on the brain, and achieves the tumor control or oncologic control. We have a sense of what kind of tumor it's going to be based on the appearance on the MRI, which kind of tailors our surgical approach. Mm -hmm. Even cancers, oftentimes, we're able to get a total resection, which really gets that patient a good, you know, tumor control. Like, you know, like we mentioned, the, you know, the blood-brain barrier can sometimes limit how responsive certain kinds of cancers are to treatment, though some cancers really do respond well to the medical treatment. The more cancer we can t get out, the better that is for the patient. There's always a sense of fear about undergoing a procedure on your brain. And I think what's different from the brain and anywhere else in the body is, you know, you and your brain are, you feel like your brain is you. It's your personality. I often get the question of, is someone going to wake up from surgery and be a different person? Mm -hmm. And then it's actually really delightful to see patients wake up and realize that they're still them. And I have patients who are cracking jokes, trying to speak other languages, just to exercise and see, you know, how magical it is that they still feel like themselves. And even oftentimes, patients who are having symptoms after surgery realize how much they were tolerating because once that tumor and that pressure is off, you know, I have folks who will say it's like a light switch turned back on. And they're like, wow, I wouldn't, didn't realize that this was causing so many issues. And I don't, you know, I'm doing so much better now that this pressure is gone. We're probably going out of order on this, but I have to ask what the symptoms are for brain cancer or um, a, a cancer of the central nervous system, right? Because we're, we're focusing on both. So headache is one of the most common symptom of brain tumors. It doesn't have to be a new headache. It could be an old headache with changing patterns or changing intensity um, makes the pa person aware of something is going on. Sometimes it is seizures. It could doesn't have to be a generalized seizure. It could be a focal seizure. Uh, sometimes it's imbalance, dizziness, lightheadedness without any clear reason. Uh, sometimes when the pressure in the brain goes up, it can manifest itself with nausea or vomiting. Um, so those are the most common symptoms that people have to pay attention. Vision changes could be one of them. Uh, sometimes personality changes for any clear reason could be a sign. You know, I get headaches all the time and I dismiss them as sinuses or sometimes I get a migraine. So when is... If this is something you have always been experiencing, like when you get sinusitis, you have symptoms of sinusitis. At the same time, you have headache. Uh, that headache has always happened and always got better. 
it shouldn't be alarming. But if a headache doesn't go away when the sinusitis symptoms are gone or keeps getting worse, or it's always been one side of the head and now it's on the other side or all over the head. Those are, you know, alarming signs. And you usually wait a few days, it doesn't get better, then you seek attention. And I, I think it's also really important that, you know, most of the time when folks are having headaches, it's not a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's something else. But the, if you're having headaches that are different from what you've had before, it, there's a wide variety of different things that could be going on medically it's, it's important to listen to your body. And if you feel like something's different, talk to your primary care doctor. Or if you don't see a primary care doctor, that'd be an opportunity to, you know, reach out and try to get evaluated because there's a, a most of the causes of headaches are benign, but they're treatable too. things ranging from migraines that are treated with medications that have gotten better and better over the over the years to someone having high blood pressure to, you know, a, a, obviously a brain tumor is what we're talking about today. But you know, if it turns out the headaches are a sign of high blood pressure, that's something that's, you know, treatable and can get you feeling better. And then globally, just get you in a better shape overall. And if it is sinuses, sinusitis is treatable too. So if you're feeling pain, Very don't, just, don't yeah. just ignore your, you know, you don't, pain that's different or persistent, the more you listen to your body and take your symptoms seriously, the better you're going to keep yourself overall. That's not to say every little thing should be a cause to call and make an emergency appointment with your doctor, but you listen to your body. People tend to have a sense when something's not quite right. And a lot of times I find when someone ultimately is diagnosed with a brain tumor, they look in retrospect and realize things have seemed off for a lot longer than they really realized. Mm -hmm. And what would um, be the first step of MRI, a CAT scan? Well, it really kind of depends on the symptoms. A lot of times we are often heading straight to an MRI. If someone's having symptoms that are very sudden, a CT scan is a good test because it's a nice quick test and it rules out bleeding, which uh, bleeding is in the brain from a stroke is actually a lot more common than brain tumors. So that's often the first test if someone comes to the emergency room because they all of a sudden have a sudden thunderclap headache. Right. But if someone's been having headaches for a while, oftentimes their doctor will get an MRI. When we're talking about neuro-oncology, uh, we also are referring to tumors or cancer of the central nervous system. So how would that be different? They do show themselves differently. So with a spinal cord tumor, oftentimes the first thing someone will notice is pain. You know, back pain, pain that what we call radiates or travels down the leg or the arm or wraps around their side. That can then progress, or sometimes the original symptom is actually numbness or loss of function, so paralysis of a part of the body. It can also be something like dramatic, sudden urinary incontinence or bowel incontinence that's new. They tend to get people's attention pretty dramatically. Yeah. As a neurosurgeon, I see a lot of patients who come in with back pain and radiating pain. And again, most of the time, it's not cancer and it's something benign and degenerative, but you got to pay, pay attention. Pain that's different, don't just push it to the side. Pay attention to your body. And you know, the, the sooner that you get a doctor to evaluate you and check you out, the better you're going to feel and the better you're going to do overall long term. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Orwa, to, the other thing difference, I think, about the tumors of the spine is that a lot of times, because, you know, cancer tends to spread from when those secondary cancers spread through the blood, the bones of the spine have such a really uh, vigorous blood supply. A lot of those tumors, tumors that wouldn't spread to the brain very much do spread to the spine. Like you had mentioned prostate cancer, where, you know, we see prostate cancer in the spine all the time. But prostate cancer in the brain, though I've seen it a handful of times, it typically is actually coming from the bones themselves too. So the cancers in the spine tend to be not always the same kinds of, uh, same kinds of cancers that we're seeing in the brain. So brain cancers can cause physical and cognitive function loss, not to mention the poor long-term survival rates that we hear about too often. How do you address that with your patients? Yeah, so I, I would say that's, again, a very individualized and ever-changing area of medicine. So, for example, when I first started training, if somebody had a non-small cell lung cancer and had a brain metastasis or a tumor that spread to the brain, it was a pretty dire prognosis. But there are patients now who we see in long-term remission with that. And so, you know, it's a very different conversation than it would have been 10 years ago. It's one that's much more reassuring. Obviously, there's not guarantees that's not everyone, but we are seeing that needle moving. There are others that we know the prognosis isn't so 
robust. And so it becomes really about education, talking to the patient, assessing kind of what their global needs and priorities are, and tailoring our treatments to meet those needs and priorities. Yeah, I could I couldn't agree more. You know, I think we really are, you know, though obviously, you know, if cancer's sp- spread to the brain or if you have a cancer that's coming from the brain tissue itself, that's obviously very serious, but I think the prognosis isn't nearly so bleak or so dismal. You know, our goals of treatment aren't just about longevity. It's also about quality of life. And a lot of times the treatments that we're offering are giving patients relief of their symptoms, where even if the prognosis for their long-term survival isn't good, we can give them the maximum quality of the life that we know they do have. And of course, we're continuing to evolve in our treatment strategies to give patients the longest possible lives with the tumors they have. The other important thing is, you know, anytime we're giving someone a, you know, a prognosis, no one truly has a crystal ball. No one ever really knows how one person is going to do. They may do worse. They may do better. And even with some of these more, you know, bleak cancers like glioblastoma, which is one of the more common cancers and unfortunately one of the most aggressive, there are patients who still can sustain, you know, be, you know, free of their free of remission and stable of with disease for quite some time. So everyone's different. And mm-hmm. most important thing is that these cancers, though very serious, are treatable. And it really is about the individual patient and kind of mentioned before, we're highlighting more and more each cancer is a little bit individual on its own. Is there any statistical information that will indicate how long the average survival rate is once a person has been diagnosed? Depends on the what type of as you mentioned, 100 different tumor types. Yeah, okay. So it really depends on the type of the tumor you find in the brain, where it's coming from. Is it coming from breast or lung? And also uh, the size and the number of it. Like if it's just one single small tumor coming from lung, we have had patients being even cured from it. There are some you know, case reports and case series reporting on that. It's not extremely uncommon. We have seen it in our practices. So it really comes down to what type of tumor um, it is, how many lesions are found in the brain, and what are the size and the location. So it affects our treatments and affects the prognosis. And increasingly the genetics of the tumor as right. well. You guys yes. send off for yes. all kinds of markers. That yeah, are, I've been, I've been so lot. excited to see everyone send <laughs> off for the, the, the Keras testing. It makes me, I, as a surgeon, my, my, uh, I think my understanding of that subtype may not be as sophisticated as yours, but it's always exciting to see and then to see the, the patients get really excited too when their treatment is able to be customized to exactly how their tumor is behaving. Yes, we have a, a full panel of different mutations uh, sometimes we call them driver mutations, sometimes sensitizing mutations. Uh, it's an area of active research. Um, as you mentioned about blood-brain barrier, those medications which are being developed, they can cross the blood-brain barrier. They have less side effects than chemotherapy. Uh, a couple of them have been approved, but there's a lot to be done for more treatment options. Yeah. So Deborah, what we're kind of, we're, you know, we're just like you hear about panels for genetic testing for trying to figure out what breed or of a subbreed your dog or cat is or right. sending your own, uh, you know, uh, information to, you know, uh, one of these, one of me. these, we- exactly. One of these websites, we're actually doing that for cancer, which we're kind of talking about. That's, that's that panel that we send, uh, we send these, these, a specimen of the tumor, uh, you know, to be analyzed so that we know exactly what kinds of chemotherapy are going to work, you know, have the best chances of working for that kind of, t- that kind of cancer. And how about immunotherapy? Is that used for neurooncology? It is in development. It has a modest effect. You know, several studies have shown it has activity, but it's not as strong as other tumors. So there are uh, modification techniques going on, different types of immunotherapy, how we can make it more uh, effective in brain tumors. It's an area of active research. Right now, especially for aggressive tumors, we are not using it, but we enroll patients on clinical trials, hopefully uh, very soon we will have uh, combinations or um, new immunotherapies which may work better. Uh, one other thing is that, you know, immunotherapy has many different types. Uh, one of the immunotherapies that right now many people are doing research on is developing certain vaccines. It could be a virus vector that you put certain antigens into it and, you know, it can attack uh, the cells indirectly by stimulating the immune system. So, 
it's not been approved yet by FDA, but uh, if patients are interested, there are many studies going on. And you've seen the growth of immunotherapy use in cancer treatment. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Explain briefly what that is. So there are many different types of immunotherapies. The one that we use a lot, for example, in lung cancer is that what happens when a cancer develops? Your body doesn't see it as enemy. So your body is the strongest you know, defense mechanism to kill cancer cells at the very, very early stage when they are at the level of a few cells. When it doesn't see that enemy, it becomes indifferent to it. So once we can stimulate the immune system in a way to become sensitive to that tumor, that can be one of the strongest strategies against cancer. That's how um, transplant works. Like in leukemia, we have been doing it for a long time. If you think about it, transplant is a kind of immunotherapy because you get somebody else's immune system into your your own system and that person's lymphocytes and immune soldiers, oh, this is cancer, we have to fight it, as opposed to your own immune system, which was not doing anything about it. So this new immune system, immunotherapy that we have, like we call it checkpoint inhibitors, they remove the break on the immune system. So because body has, for any mechanism we have, it has a counter mechanism. Like, you know, it doesn't want the immune system to go really wild and attack your own body. So it always has a break on immune system, slow down, slow down. If immunotherapy is successful, it can remove that break and immune system gets activated and can see the cancer right now. Basically, it changes your body the way your body sees the antigens on tumor cells. Okay. That's complicated stuff. (laughs) Yeah. The immunology is increasingly complicated, and I think we're finding increasingly relevant to every field of medicine. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, Dr. Vodashevitz, glioblastoma, glioblastoma being the most Mm -hmm. common of adult brain cancers. What are the symptoms for that, and how is it diagnosed? So, you know, glioblastoma, also referred to as high-grade glioma or GBM for short. Uh, Some folks may have heard that, that term. So it's a malignant tumor that comes from the brain tissue itself. And that's the most common primary brain tumor. So that's a tumor coming from the brain uh, in adults. And the symptoms of glioblastoma are pretty similar to the symptoms of other tumors. Because glioblastoma is an aggressive and quickly growing cancer, unfortunately, the symptoms tend to be pretty a little bit more dramatic than something that's a more benign process that's been growing a lot, a little more slowly. So it's a lot more common for folks with a glioblastoma to present from, with a seizure from the brain tissue being irritated by that expanding tumor or to start noticing weakness in the arms or legs because that tumor is growing too fast for your brain to be able to adapt and reroute the functions. And then, you know, any mass that's growing quickly, the, you know, headaches, tend to be a little more prominent. I'll say I see patients with glioblastoma present more with the symptoms of seizures and weakness than I do with headache. And the headache tends to be a little bit more common in folks with those more slow growing tumors. But, you know, again, we can, we, that's certainly a warning sign as well. Help me understand the, the journey for the uh, patient. At first, they see usually neurosurgeon because we have to make the diagnosis. Sometimes, you know, it may be easy. Maybe I can make that diagnosis as well. Like if I have a patient with stage four lung cancer and the cancer is everywhere in the body and now there is a spot in the brain, I really don't need to biopsy that. But for someone who had remote cancer a long time ago and it was early stage and it was cured, and now um, there's a new mass in the brain or somebody who never had history of cancer. And now we find a tumor in the brain. And the first stop is with a neurosurgeon uh, to make it do a biopsy and uh, make the diagnosis. Then sometimes that biopsy or at the same time, removal or debulking or, you know, um, some kind of removal of the tumor. Maybe it's all the patient needs, depends on the type of the tumor. Then um, the need for a radiation oncologist like Dr. Orwat to determine if the patient needs radiation after the surgery. For certain types of tumors, um, chemotherapy is indicated or targeted therapy is indicated. And uh, we sometimes combine it with radiation together. 
Uh, sometimes it is sequential or, you know, they go first or we go later. And the most important thing is that it's a multidisciplinary approach. We are all involved. We are in constant um, communication. We present our patients on tumor board. Tumor board has pathologists, radiologists, neurologists, neurosurgeon, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists. We are all putting our heads together. And we follow the patients through that. We present and represent and we follow. That is the most important aspect of MedStar neuro-oncology program. What's the most common question that you get from patients? First, uh, they want to know if they can be cured. And the second is that how the treatment is going to affect my quality of life. I is imagine that the same? Yeah, abso- absolutely. I think that's the, the, you know, those are the most common, the most common questions, you know, what is this? What does this mean for me long term? And um, what does this mean for me short term? You know, what am I in for for this treatment? Is this going to be? You know, am I going to be sick for weeks in a bed with not being able to do anything? Am I going to be you know in the hospital for a super long time? Uh, a lot of times, I think people have a, a sense of how the treatment is going to be, and it actually isn't nearly as arduous as they as they imagine it's it's going to be. And I think the more information that you have about the treatment, the less intimidating, less scary that it can be. It really is about an individualized treatment plan that's not just directed at what kind of tumor the person has, but what kind of person that, you know, we're we're working with. Every patient has different ideas of what is and is not acceptable and what they are and are not willing to go through. I, I do get a lot of questions um, about proton therapy. Uh, Dr. Orwat, can you uh, speak to that? Yes, I get that question quite often as well. So proton therapy is a specialized form of radiation, kind of radiation with better breaks. And in some patients, that's helpful and necessary. And if so, we absolutely will accommodate getting you set up at one of the centers that offer that, such as down at MedStar Georgetown or whichever center works best for you. Now, for other patients, there might be other forms of radiation therapy that are just as effective, but you can get closer to home, or they're even more effective, such as stereotactic radiosurgery, which we do here at MedStar Franklin Square with CyberKnife. Um, other people, really what they need is a more traditional fractionated radiation approach. So it very much so is a conversation to have that goes back to that customizing your treatment for you. What's your most memorable case? I have a I have a lot. One that I was thinking of just now was actually a, a patient who had a history of breast cancer that was thought to be under control and came in with some issues with walking and dizziness and a little bit of some headache and was found to have just these multiple massive tumors in her brain. We did a, I did end up doing a biopsy because it didn't seem clear that this could be the breast cancer coming back. Turned out it was the breast cancer, but fortunately it was a kind of breast cancer that was hormone sensitive. So the combination of radiation and chemotherapy, that patient on the MRIs, there's the tiniest little spot from where these gigantic tumors used to be, but her quality of life is great. And she's a a young, not a, not an older person who Mm -hmm. has a lot of quality and quantity of life left ahead of her. So that I think to me is a real big win for us as a multidisciplinary team with, you know, surgery, medicine, and radiation oncology. How did you get them to shrink up to be just a dot on the imaging was it i i have to we have to credit the radiation in the medical oncology and just give the you know that's i think that's just a sense of when you initially when i initially had looked at that scan i would have thought i'm not going to be seeing this lady in a couple of months and mm. years later wow her you would have you would bet you could barely tell on the mri that anything is there wow so i have a story it happened during my fellowship my training and at that time emrs were not that much developed so everything was you know paper charts so it was a new patient to me not to the institution so they brought three volumes of charts very thick and i started reading through it two hours before the patient comes i saw Breast cancer, HER2 positive, brain metastasis, surgery. Two years later, recurrence in brain, radiation. And this was three volumes. I thought the patient is going to come in on a stretcher. She came in walking and said, oh, I'm just back from Caribbean trip. And then she was wow. playing tennis three times a week. Totally defied the odds. That was amazing. I never forget that. How about you, Dr. Overbot? Yeah, I think the the people who do so much better than we expect are always kind of the things that stick with us. And 
really motivate you and help you continue to do what we do. Um, I have two that jumped to mind that are relatively recent in the past couple years. One is a woman who did have one of those glioblastoma for reasons I truly cannot explain, has finished all of treatment, been off of treatment for a year and a half now. And me and her medical oncologist see her MRIs every so many months and they're clean. She has a great quality of life. She's getting her driver's license back. We can't explain it, but we're thrilled. Uh, Another is a patient who did have a non-small cell lung cancer that went to the brain. I did stereotactic radiation, so the really targeted radiation to a couple of spots. Then we treated her lung cancer like we would any other stage three lung cancer. And she also has been off of all treatment, even the immunotherapy for quite some time doing well. So patients like that or patients who, Dr. Vodashevitz, you've taken a tumor out of the brain, uh, is there a risk for it to grow back? Could that happen? There, There is. And what we follow those patients very closely, mm-hmm. and it, it's important that once you, not just for neuro-oncology, but for you know, medicine in general, you want to follow up with the doctor because it's the follow-up that keeps you in good shape. It, it's always thrilling to see someone who, you know, after surgery, they find that their speech is back and, you know, they're clarity of thinking is better and the lights are turned on again and now they don't need a wheelchair or even a cane and they're walking on their own again. That's great to see. But I like to see those patients continually doing well. Mm -hmm. And that's why we monitor so closely with repeat MRIs when we know that the person has a kind of tumor that has a higher chance of growing back or is a little bit more aggressive. We monitor those patients and follow them up, see them in the office. and, And the MRI only tells you so much. You know, seeing someone in person tells you a lot. And sometimes the MRI, a little bit of scar tissue and a tumor recurring can look a little similar. Mm -hmm. And so we have to follow people very closely and really see how they're doing um, to keep them in good shape. I would agree with that. Those are tricky cases because your first impulse is to do something, but sometimes the right thing to do is to take a step back and watch them because it can fool you. Mm -hmm. So I would like to echo that completely. It's not just the MRI studies. It's it's also how the person's doing. Yeah. And it's not just, we're not just seeing the person in the office just to high five ourselves and say, yeah, all right, still doing good. You know, it's, <laughs> it's to make sure we can really pick up because the sooner, even if there is something unusual in the MRI or something we don't, that's not quite what we would want to see, the sooner we know about it, the sooner we can act on it and treat it if that's what needs to happen. That's how you keep people in good shape. And that's how those people who do have, you know, stage four cancer that spreads to the brain stay in good shape because- they, they keep up with their MRIs, and if anything looks like it's starting to act up, we can act and address it. There have been so many advances made to give neuro-oncology patients a more positive prognosis. Thanks to the good work happening in medicine and science, and thanks to you for the wonderful work that you do for patients. Thank you for caring compassionately. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. We've been talking with Dr. Masama Hebtash, Dr. Kelly Orwat, and Dr. Teresa Vodashevitz at MedStar Franklin Square Medical Center in Baltimore. To make an appointment with a neuro-oncology specialist, call 443-969-8059.